There's a phase of marriage, I would venture to guess, everybody experiences. I think it may be universal. I can only tell you I feel that way. I'm hoping that because I've been there, Sarah and I've been there at least once, probably a couple of times. And it's when you feel like roommates. Now, when you're particularly a Christian and you're single, you just feel like if, if you're lonely, you're like, you know what's going to solve this? Marriage. <laughs> Are you laughing, Ron? I am laughing. Why? Why would you laugh at that? It, marriage is the solution to loneliness, isn't it? Uh, sometimes. And some of the time, but it also can magnify your loneliness sometimes. I like how you put that. Would you ladies agree with that? Yes, I think so, yeah. If magnify your loneliness. Okay, so why would it magnify it, do we think? I think because there's someone else there, mm-hmm. but it's it feels like they don't even know you exist sometimes. So then it's even more, you feel more aware that you're alone. Yeah, like if you're going through a phase where you're not connecting, you're mm-hmm. like, well, there's this person, but I can't talk to them. Yeah, yeah, it's like almost torture to be seen but not known. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, for Sarah and I, I feel like the roommate phase was at its worst when we had our second child. And um, sorry, Lauren, I'm not that's saying okay. I'm not trying to project onto you <laughs> yeah. that that's where you are now with Eddie, but we were in a different phase. You had kids closer in age together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. They were 17 months apart, and. We, oh goodness, we had a lot of reasons. I don't have enough time to go into that. But we were not in a healthy cycle, the two of us. And we were essentially arguing about whose turn it was to get extra sleep, whose turn it was to do this and that. And we were just Mm -hmm. coordinating our lives around two very needy infants, you know? And it was brutal. And we both kind of had an underlying sense towards each other of this isn't fair. Mm -hmm. You've got it better than me. Mm. because we were both so miserable. Do you connect in any way to that, or is it just a Brian problem? Um, Not right now, but yes. You understand where I'm coming mm-hmm. from on that? Okay. Yeah. So here's how psychology today paints this picture, and I think there's a unique way Christians ought to view the idea of being lonely in your marriage relationship. But psychology today can get us, I think, halfway there. Here's the way they describe the situation. You and your partner hardly ever fight, but something's missing in your relationship. A sense of being lovers, of passion, of emotional intimacy, of closeness. The pain of missing out on a deep love that feels just out of reach is heartbreaking. And since there's no arguments, no clear history of relationship problems to point to, you're left wondering, how did we get here? Now, I described a phase of... Um, that involve conflict. But this one, I see this one more as the the couple who raises kids for 15 to 18 years. And then the kids start to become independent somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And you're like a really good partner with your spouse. You coordinate schedules well. You got the whole meal plan going. You're doing the grocery shopping. Pick up, drop off. You got your little hobbies. Mm-hmm. But you really are not close to this person. Yeah, I think that's what happens when you put your marriage on autopilot. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy to do it, Daria. It is. Yeah, and I think even in the phase you and Jimmy are at, it's easy to get into this like robotic routine because I think people thrive in routine. Mm-hmm. But r- routine, I think, often works against closeness. Yeah, and it, it can be. So I, I just saw a friend over the weekend who I haven't seen in almost a year, and we had some really great conversations because we hadn't seen each other in a while. We had a lot to catch up on. Um, But when you get used to a person that's there day in and day out, you can forget that those conversations are just as important, even if you see them all the time. I still remember uh, Sarah and I went out to dinner in the midst of our marriage intensive with Ray and Nancy Kane. Uh, So we did this super intense day, and it was like we get to a stopping point, and they're like, so you want to grab dinner? And we're like, (laughs) you want to eat with us after this? (laughs) So we go out to eat, and Nancy told me that only about 10% of Christian marriages are really healthy and thriving Mm. and so i think this roommate's idea is rampant in the church likely probably not that anyone's doing anything intentionally wrong i think it's just the nature of how we work it just ends up that way so um if you're wondering how did we get there the answer according to psychology today is it's a pattern of mutual withdrawal instead of having the tough conversations both partners have learned to shut down their own needs and become self-sufficient instead of turning to each other for contact, care, and comfort. Over time, this has led to a pattern in which neither partner leans on the other for their attachment needs to be met. 
leaving both partners with unmet needs in the relationship. And the more that needs for closeness go unmet in the relationship, the more each partner learns to cope by turning away. The thinking is, when I don't get what I need, I take care of myself. However, this creates a culture of distance in the relationship. All of a sudden, turning towards each other, leaning on each other, and expressing affection become awkward. Mm. I would tweak him a little bit there. Okay. Because it sounds like he's saying it's a conscious thought of, I don't get what I need, so I'll get it myself, you know, rely on myself, whatever. I'm, I'm not sure it's always deliberate. It, you might just start to rely on yourself because it's easier, you know. I can yeah. do this, you know, instead of having to wait and explain things to my wife and see if she's got time to do this. I'll just handle it myself. And then, you know, the, the wife, the same with the husband. Well, I can't wait till he gets home from work, blah, blah, blah. I'll just do it. And so little by little, you're doing everything yourself and not necessarily saying it's not that I can't, I'm not getting help from them. It's just that it's easier to do it myself. No, I, I'm with you hundred percent on that. Yeah, I think it's a, sorry, Brian, I think, I think it's a slow drift. Yeah. I don't think anyone intentionally says, I'm going to wreck my marriage today. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> these things happen over time. Yeah, no, it, it really does. Um, so I think some folks are probably connecting with this concept. So the, the deeper issue and the more important question is, how do you get out of this? Because yeah. I think it should be our heart's desire as believers to have, uh, to have a healthy, thriving marriage. So how do you get out of the roommate phase? All right, we've been chatting before the break, if you're just tuning in, about a phase of marriage I think many, dare I say, most couples experience. And it's the roommate phase where you kind of wake up and you go, how did we get here? I mean, we're not arguing all the time, but there's really not a significant difference between us and what roommates are like. Um, and marriage is supposed to be more than that. It is. It's supposed to be more than that. Mm -hmm. So how do you get out of it? It says in psychology today, if you want to break this pattern and feel closer to your partner, you need to stop avoiding tough conversations. You need to start opening up about your feelings and needs. That's hard to start when you haven't talked about those things. Mm. I mean, you almost have to schedule it. You can't be like, are you, wait, are you picking up the kids at six? six? Yeah, okay. By the way, I feel alone, okay? <laughs> See you later. As the other spouse is heading out the door to jump in the car. I feel alone. Now, they give a... A possible entry point. Here's what they say. This could sound something like, hey, I've noticed that I've been going into my corner lately. I want to break our pattern and share how I've been feeling. What I'm recognizing is that I've been feeling inadequate lately because I've been seeing you going into your corner too. I miss you. And what I think I need is some time with you tonight. Can we spend an evening together? Do we like that? Would you respond well to that? Yeah, I, I do like that. Um, I think for some people that might be a hard subject to bring up, though, especially if you've been coasting like this for a while and you're not sure if the other person wants to be closer or if they're just content with how things are. Yeah, I think many people would have a tendency to be like, you're not close to me anymore. Yeah, that's not going to go well. No, not at all. This one seemed to kind of build off the I statements. Like, I've been going in my corner and ignoring you a lot, and I feel mm -hmm. like you might be doing that too, and I want more. I don't know why you couldn't just look at somebody and be less melodramatic and go, <laughs> you, you look at your spouse. You're laughing because I'm melodramatic? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can look at your spouse and go, I feel like we're roommates. Do you feel like that, that way? I feel like you should have that kind of relationship with your spouse where you can just come out and, like, I like the other statement, but I feel like with the person you're married to and know better than anybody, you should be able to be a little bit more direct. Yeah, you'd be like, hey, I feel like we're roommates, and I, I love you. I don't want to feel like that. I don't know what to do. Or even lifting out from that previous paragraph, just the comment, I miss you. That can be a conversation starter in and of itself. Yeah, I, Sarah and I have said that to each other when we're, we see each other every day. I miss mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. you. You guys are nodding like you've done that? Yeah, when I was um, pregnant with Ellis and... Um, we were just kind of in a hard phase with Trey's sleep. We were in a new place. We were at 
knew we were temporarily at my parents' house. Um, and I was going to sleep early because, number one, I was exhausted and also this job. And I was starting an hour earlier than here. Right. And so I went to sleep pretty early. I'd basically put Trey to sleep and then go to sleep myself. And so we didn't have much time together. And we, as I would be putting Trey to sleep, Eddie would just, you know, start playing some games. And then I'd come out of Trey's room and be like, oh, you know, I'll just go to sleep now. <laughs> and so we didn't have much time together. And so I, I remember saying, I just like, I miss you. I miss being with you. And it made me have, like, on weekends to really try to stay up late and, like, work to stay awake <laughs> and not just fall asleep while we're watching a show together or something, but to be intentional about that time together. Yeah, Jimmy and I work opposite shifts a fair amount, so it's not uncommon for us to not even see each other at all on a, on a given day sometimes. Um, That's hard. It is, um, but it, it's... Like, okay, I, I sleep next to this person, but I haven't had a meaningful mm-hmm. conversation with them in, in two weeks. It's hard. So how do you break the cycle? How do you, I mean, they're, they're saying, obviously, you have to break the ice at some point. But yeah, oftentimes, life moves at a pace where you almost have to make room for that discussion. Schedule it. And sometimes, maybe you can start without the discussion. If, if the definition of this is that you're, you're taking care of your own needs, each partner, well, then look to what what you used to do for her. In in my case, I'm thinking of Dana. And what is, is there something that, you know, I used to do that she's taken over doing for herself because I've been too self-absorbed on my own needs and issues. And if there's nothing you can think of, then remember, you know, what her favorite drink from Starbucks is or her favorite flowers or just something, you know, give something to her to, to kind of break the ice that way. You don't have to be like, you know, wah, wah, I feel lonely. (laughs) You're not meeting my needs, which it can end up, even if you couch it the right way, it still comes across that way. Yeah, no, I, right. I mean, break the ice in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I will tell you that if you even sit down and chat about this and you still feel kind of lost, you don't have to wait for a crisis to go to marriage counseling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah and I looked for, uh, there's people trained in this. You can, you know, there's Fieldstone Counseling. There's, I think Emerge is another Emerge, one in town. Yeah, North Coast Family. But also search through the insurance directory with your insurance provider and look for the suffix. So the train, the, the suffix MFT, mm-hmm. marriage and family therapist. And that's somebody who's trained in marriage that, that's what that's what we ended up doing, looking for a marriage and family therapist. So they have extra training in that front. And they can help you. Mm-hmm. Again, I think far too often people, my my generation and older, have viewed the counselor as the last resort in a major crisis. When I think it's the first step if you're having a hard time connecting. Why not go then? As opposed to wait till you just don't like each other anymore. <laughs> you know. And then I also will say, I think one of the big problems for believers is that we think that the solution by itself would just be turning towards each other, as John Gottman puts it in his mm. his books. Um, and the reason that's not enough is because many of us, I think, turn our marriage into an idol. You knew where I was going. Yeah. It's so easy to turn your spouse into your idol. But if you truly believe that if you can just get your marriage right, you're going to experience happiness and fulfillment, you're wrong. Your, your spouse not, is not capable of fully fulfilling your life. Right. I think you need to remember that marriage is designed to mirror the covenant that we have with Jesus. So that's one incentive to get your marriage right into also remembering that the ideal healthy relate marriage relationship should be very similar to what you have with Jesus and you should always be striving to put him first. Yeah, and I know for many of us that sounds like a oh, that's nice. Yeah, love God the most. I don't know how to do that because you've been placing your entire expectation for your fulfillment in life on your spouse. Not only is that unfair, it's literally idolatry and you need to repent. Your spouse is a broken sinner and they are not capable of making you feel complete and fulfilled. Not capable. They will fail you every time. Who's they? Any person. (laughs) Uh, You need to put Christ first. That's why it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's, I mean, loving God first is where it comes from. And David got this. 
And there's some portions of the Psalms that really make it a, a beautiful picture. He writes in Psalm 16, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. That's how much he loves the Lord. Mm-hmm. And he had a wife, a couple of them, I think, actually. <laughs> Several. <laughs> Yeah, and so again, he said, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with a joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And then, of course, you have Paul. I think he summarizes a similar sentiment well in Philippians 4. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret to being content in every and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Another way to paraphrase that is the Brian translation, if you apply it to marriage. I've learned to be content no matter what my marriage feels like today. Whether I feel alone or, or happy and connected, whether I feel angry at my spouse or loving towards them. How have I figured this out? Because I can do all things through Christ, who is the source of my strength. Mm. Jesus ought to be your first love. Then your marriage can fall into place. That's how a Christian would write this article differently. But at the same time, I want to be sure you understand, I'm not a guy who wants to throw out psychology. A lot of Christians do that, and I think it's foolish and silly. Um, The concept of turning towards each other, having direct conversations, not only biblical, but it's psychologically a great idea. Go get some help. You don't have to be so alone in your marriage.